The year is 586 AD. The location is in northern Mesopotamia, Solashan. Here on the arid sands will take place yet another battle in the long line of conflicts between east and west, between Greece and Persia. A conflict that began hundreds of years earlier at Marathon. Here on the field stand the two great armies of the Sassanid Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. Here, two men will go head to head for the glory of their respective nations. Here, at the Battle of Solashan. Now, with new video game technology, we go back in time to get a view the generals wished they'd had of the army tactics, formations, the generals' plans and thoughts coming into battle, and how the battles were won and lost. We travel back to different eras of human history, but the one thing that connects them all? War. Carnage. Glory and despair. We go back for the battles of the ages. It's hot out today. Hot as can be expected in the eastern lands at this time of the year. And there are thousands of men aching from thirst. The Persians were blocked from the Arzamon River about a half mile behind the Roman lines, while the Persians were readying iron bars and chains for all the prisoners they expected to take. Thousands of soldiers waiting for the order to kill each other. But why are these men even here? What has brought them to this doomed scenario? To understand that, we need to look back 14 years earlier. It's 572, and the Roman Empire is not the beast of power and disciplined efficiency it once was. It has completely collapsed in the west some years earlier, but in the east it thrives. No longer in Rome, but an empire of diverse people who completely see themselves as Romans. But they are not the only superpower anymore, and Persia in the east has re-risen as the Sassanid Empire. In 572, the Eastern Roman Emperor Justin II refused to renew the annual payments to Sassanid Persia, using as a pretext the recent major revolt in Persian Armenia and regarding the annual tributes as an indignity unworthy of Romans. This tribute was part of a peace treaty between Justin's uncle, Justinian I, and the Persian Shah Khosrau I in 562. This marked the culmination of the deterioration of Roman-Persian relations over the years, and began rounds of peace and war between the Persians and Greek Romans for years after. In 582, Maurice, who served as a general in the war, ascended to the Eastern Roman throne at Constantinople. But by that time, the Persians had gained the upper hand in Mesopotamia through the capture of Dara in 574, while the Romans prevailed in Arzanane, southwestern Armenia. After the failure of another round of peace negotiations, Maurice appointed his brother-in-law, Philippicus, as commander-in-chief of the Mesopotamian front in 584. Philippicus made use of his new command and began raiding the regions around Nisibis and Arzanane in 584 and 585. The Persian commander, Kardaragan, or Black Hawk, responded with an unsuccessful siege of Philippicus' main base, Monocartan. In spring 586, Maurice rejected new peace proposals that involved renewed payments in gold. The Romans were eager for a real battle, and they would not even consider peace until every soldier had their swords stained in Persian blood. Philippicus marched his army south from his base at Amida, crossed the Arzamon River to the eastern bank, and advanced some nine miles east to the plain of Solashan. This position south of the Mardis and Dara fortresses allowed Philippicus to control the Arzamon River and forced the Persian army under Kardaragan to march across the waterless plain away from supply routes before meeting the Roman force. And so, on the plain of Solashan, the two ancient rivals, eager to tear into each other's flesh, would meet once again for bloody battle. In 586, the Eastern Roman Empire was a very different beast than their imperial forebears just a couple hundred years earlier. They ruled the eastern half of the Roman Empire because the west had collapsed long ago, but just a couple decades earlier they had come off a costly war to expand and try to take back the western empire under the emperor Justinian. In many ways they were successful, 
but after the death of Justinian they began losing territory to invasions and outright abandonment. The Eastern Empire would never be as strong as they were under Justinian again, but in 586 they were still the most powerful nation in the Western world. But even for the times, the army Eastern Rome brought was not quite the norm. Rome, always known for their elite infantry, came to this battle a lot like their Persian counterparts, with an almost exclusively cavalry-centric army. You would think that Philippicus had learned of Roman history and knows of the disaster at Carrhae under Crassus. Philippicus would know not to be so arrogant that he thinks he can march into the dry east with no access to water and weighed down by hundreds of slow and heavy infantry cohorts to fight a cavalry-based army on their home turf. Both armies were cavalry-centric with a mix of lancers, horse archers, and a few cataphracts. This battle was between two men who knew what they were doing, and with such similar tools at their disposal, at the end of the day, Victory was going to go to the man who could wield them the best. When Philippicus learned from his scouts about the Persian advance, he positioned his men on elevated ground facing the Sassanids, with his left flank protected by the foothills of Mount Azalis. The Romans were arranged in a single battle line with three divisions, with the left commanded by Elifredas, the dukes of Phoenice Libanensis, which had a contingent of Hunnic horse archers. The center was commanded by General Heracleus the Elder, later Exarch of Africa and father of the future Emperor Heracleus, and the right was commanded by Vitalius. This arrangement was adopted by the Persians as soon as they came into view of the Roman army, with their right led by Mebotus, the center led by Cardarigan himself, and the left commanded by Aphrates, Cardarigan's nephew. Unlike his counterpart, Philippicus stayed behind the Roman lines with a small force directing the battle. After a short halt to leave their baggage train behind and form the battle line, the Persians quickly moved in on the Romans, shooting arrows as they approached. The Romans responded in kind and sallied forth to meet the Persians. In this battle, both sides had access to horse archers and cataphracts, one deadly from afar, the other devastating up close. Most horse archers used the composite bow, smaller and perfect for horseback, but also with a weightier shot with an almost armor-piercing quality. But if the horse archer was like the ancient equivalent to a drive-by, the cataphract was the ancient world's tank. A cataphract was a fully armored cavalry soldier, fully armored from head to toe, from horse to rider. This armor weighed down the horseman, making him heavy, solid, a fast moving brick wall. And anyone in the way of this wall would be smashed. And in the east, cataphracts were all the rage. The fighting was vicious, men and horses falling one by one. But it wasn't long before an advantage was gained. On the right, Vitalius was quickly victorious, his heavy cavalry breaking through the Persian flank and pushing the Persians to the left behind their own main line. At this point, however, disaster threatened as many of Vitalius' troops broke formation, heading for the Persian baggage train, intending to loot it. Philippicus saw this, however, and acted quickly. He gave his distinctive helmet to one of his bodyguards, Theodore Ilibinus, and sent him to rally the cavalry on the pain of punishment by the army commander himself. The ruse worked. The men recognized the helmet and returned to order just in time to stop the Persians, who had regrouped in the center and were pushing the numerically inferior Romans back. To counter this, Philippicus ordered the men of the central division to dismount and form a shield wall with their spears projecting from it.
It's not totally clear what happened next, but apparently the Roman archer shot at the Persian horses, breaking their momentum. At the same time, the Roman left managed to launch a successful counter-thrust, which drove back the opposing Persian right in disarray. Soon, the Persian right had broke and fled, chased down by the Romans. With both wings having disintegrated, the Persian center was completely open to an attack by the reformed Roman right, which drove them towards the area once occupied by the Persian right. How numbered and attacked from several sides, the entire Persian army would soon shatter and flee. The broken Persian army suffered greatly, not only from Roman pursuit, but also due to lack of water. Before the battle, Kardargan had ordered the water supplies poured to the ground, trying to make his men fight harder to break through the Byzantine army and reach the Arzaman. It clearly didn't work. The surviving Persians were refused entry into Dara since, according to 7th century Eastern Roman historian Simokata, Persian custom forbade entrance to fugitives. Simokata also narrates that many Persians died of thirst or from water poisoning when they drank too much water from the wells after their exhausting fight. Kardargan himself escaped the massacre, fleeing to a nearby hilltop with a small detachment of men, where they withstood several Roman attacks. After three or four days, the Romans, unaware the Persian commander was there, abandoned the effort. Kardargan escaped the battle with his life, but at an enormous cost to his men, while Philippicus stands over the corpses of his enemies, victorious in the sands of Solishan. Following the battle, Philippicus rewarded the soldiers who had distinguished themselves and divided the spoils of the defeated Persians among them. He then proceeded to invade Arzanine again. However, his attempt to capture the fortress of Clomarin was thwarted when Kardargan arrived with reinforcements. The Byzantine army retreated to the fortress of Afuman, fighting off the shadowing Persians as they go. This battle was an important victory, but not a decisive one. The war would drag on for years longer with no clear winner, but it allowed the Romans to gain an upper hand in the region. Eventually, the revolt of Bahram Choban had led the rightful Persian Shah to seek refuge in Roman territory, and afterward a joint expedition was launched that restored Khosrau II to his throne, and a peace treaty was signed in 591 that left most of Armenia in Roman hands. Though not a decisive battle like Pharsalus, or a popular battle like Cannae, Solishan was still epic in its own right, and a great example of the Eastern fighting style at the time. It was another epic clash between East and West, between Roman and Persian, between conquerors and the conquered. Truly a battle for the ages.